For longer than I care to remember, I've always felt a longing. Call it fate, call it destiny, call it divine providence. Really, I don't care what force you want to attribute it to. Because to me, it never really felt like some outside force tugging me towards the weird and macabre. It always felt like it was something a part of myself. It was undefinable, indescribable. It was just me. Now that you know this, I'm sure that it would come as no surprise to you readers that I'm no different than you with your curious nature. I browsed the paranormal board on 4chan, I've read stories on here, and I've fed my morbid curiosities more than a few times in the deep web. Now that you know this, I'm sure that you think I'm a self-assured spiritualist, but that would not be the case. You see, I'm a scully, not a molder. I am the forever skeptic, and as long as something can be chalked up to practical reason or just plain coincidence, I will take that over the conclusion of some old-school haunt or a weird pseudo-scientific theory. I don't believe in demonology. I don't believe in EVP recordings pointing to anything more than noise pollution and audio equipment. I don't believe in an afterlife or God. Not to say these things are not possible, but I have a philosophy that I like to follow in regards to things like that. Whosoever makes extraordinary claims, then so too does the burden of proof belong to them. Jeremy is just one such person that gets carried away with supernatural claims. So much so that I sometimes feel as he's a bit conspiratorial and believes the whole world is run by lizard monsters in human skin suits. Jeremy is a great big, plucked turkey of a man with a swollen belly and a waddle in his step. I think that he's in his mid-thirties. Jeremy is also my equipment guy. He knows how to run the camera and the audio equipment. I remember when I was originally contacted by Redacted to research paranormal anomalies. Redacted paid well and provided me with gas and peridium. Apparently, one of the reps had read my article on Euthyphro and thought that I would be the perfect person to conduct unbiased investigations into the paranormal perhaps to add some validity to the metaphysical. I jumped at the opportunity, of course. I was told Jeremy would pick me up the following week and we would hit the road immediately. I was gushing. I could not wait to get on the road during long nights like some kind of hard-boiled detective novel hero, with neon lights flashing by in a haze. My wanderlust dripped right out of my feet with every step I took towards the beat-up truck waiting for me at the end of the sidewalk. The truck had a camper top over its bed, but when I rounded that and saw the man sitting in the driver's seat, I knew that maybe I had told a redacted yes just a little too quickly. The man sitting in the truck was Jeremy. I put my luggage in the back and I hopped into the passenger seat. On that first day, I learned that Jeremy was a rapid talker that liked to speak with his mouth full of jerky. At first, I thought maybe this would be alright. I am a listener by trade, but as the day turned to night and Jeremy continued to spew on and on about how everybody in his family could see and talk to ghosts, I could feel the migraine coming on. Yeah, so the first time I ever saw a spirit, it was my grandmother. She left her Bible on my bed and walked directly into the closet. I was nine and ran to my parents' bedroom telling them what I saw. Well, that's when my mom sat me down and gave me the talk. Anyway, from then on, I knew that I wanted to try and push back the veil and see what other planes of existence there were. He paused, long as though he was waiting for me to respond. I said nothing and I stared out of the passenger side window. Jeremy continued, and so I started taking paranormal courses at my local community college. That was neat. I learned all about EVPs and religious symbolism and how crap Ouija boards are. I guess that's why Redacted contacted me. What exactly are you into that caught their eye? I write. What kind of stuff do you write? Academic papers and articles. I'm guessing this finally clued Jeremy into the fact that I wasn't into conversation nearly as much as he was, because the rest of the ride was mostly silent, except for when he discussed the first case that we had been sent on together. Apparently, it was an alien sighting. 
Most people have the gall to send in photos of vague shapes in the sky and claim that they're UFOs. But the photo that accompanied this folder was one of a supposedly bona fide ET squatting in a garden. The image was relatively clear but was using some kind of night vision to capture the photo. There was a slick skinned small humanoid figure with bugged absolute black eyes hunkered down over a bed of daffodils like he was ready to drop his next rap single in this lady's backyard. The limbs were wrinkled and gangly looking, but overall it was nothing that couldn't be achieved through prosthetics or simple editing software. Jeremy assured me the image had not been doctored. We stopped off in a small town in Illinois for a nightcap and hotel. I'd be lying if I didn't admit that after getting a solid bite to eat and a few dark brown ales down my gullet, I began to warm to Jeremy's chatter. We had chosen a small hipster bar with industrial interior designs and staff with piercings and beanies. Watching Jeremy smash open peanuts on the bar counter and enthusiastically spread his hands as he talked about all the ghost stories from his childhood seemed entertaining in the moment, and my inner critic was kept at bay by the increasing warmth creeping into my cheeks. I began asking him about Redacted and whether or not they were good at keeping people under their employees safe and as well paid as they promised me. He nodded and filled me with the exception that some of the investigators disappear sometimes. I outright guffawed at this and almost spit on my beer. Oh, don't be so dramatic. No, no, Alex, really. Granted, most of the ones I've known to disappear do it because they've had their fun and finally found something in this crazy world that scared the crap out of them. Can't fault them for that. I asked the question. So, do some of them disappear because of the cases that they've been working on? Sure. How many of us are working for Redacted? I don't know. We paid our tab with a credit card given to Jeremy by our employers and walked across the street to our hotel room, and we bunkered down for the night. Overall, that first day was like a listless dream and everything drifted by in an uneventful chain. I remember lying on my back that night and staring up into the dark and thinking that this was all there would be to this job. I would be traveling cross country and checking in on yokels too dumb to realize that they had accidentally pressed their finger in front of the lens before taking a picture. That would be fine by me. I would be getting paid handsomely for it. All names besides mine and the equipment guys have been altered. I will be posting my findings here. Thank you. Case 1 we met Mary in her home in southern Illinois at the end of an old crumbling road where the nearest neighbor was probably through the woods that lined her property, and found out quickly that she was a soft-spoken elderly woman that enjoyed cooking and not much else. Mary was constantly fiddling with a pair of glasses that hung from her neck on a goldish chain. She reminded me of a grandmother but she lived alone and apparently had never married. No man could ever hold her down. She told me as Jeremy had rustled his camera out of the back of the truck. I stood on her wraparound porch with her while Jeremy sauntered up and powered up the camera, pointing it at us. When Jeremy gave me the thumbs up, Mary invited us in and we sat in her carpeted living room and I began the interview. It said in your file that you had seen weird things and heard noises at night. That's right. She squinted at me and put her glasses on and then took them back off after a moment. Would you care to elaborate on that? Um, it was very strange at first. You see, out here the worst thing you'd find lurking in the dark might be some small scavenger animals like coyotes, but I hadn't seen one of those in this area in a very long time. And then I got to wondering whether it was my own imagination. I would go out and find my garden totally destroyed. It was ridiculous. I thought maybe some wild dog was doing it. Sometimes I would hear something messing around off to the side of the house and I would find my trash cans knocked over. Garbage everywhere. That must have happened. She paused and pursed her lips. Maybe three or four times before I got the cameras installed. Then stuff stopped for a while. I felt safe for about a month or so and I thought that that was the end. 
That wasn't the end, though, I asked. Oh, no, not at all. She cupped her hand and placed it against the side of her face with a sigh. I was sleeping in my bedroom and something, God, I don't know what woke me up. I felt like something was standing at the foot of my bed. I felt like a little girl all over again. I wanted to pull the blankets up over my head and maybe whatever was there would just go away. But as my eyes cleared up and I stared down at the bottom of the bed, I saw that there was no one. Nothing there. My paranoia settled in again. I mean, if nothing was happening around here and it was just my own imagination, then maybe I was going crazy. After all, I'm not as young as I once was. Kind of a lose-lose situation, huh? That's right. Either I'm acting off in my old age or someone is seriously messing with me. I lay there in bed for maybe half an hour until I realized that there was a shadow of a man standing in the window next to my bedside table. God, I just, uh, I just started screaming, but that didn't seem to bother him any at all. He just stayed there for a long time. It was as though he knew that I couldn't do anything to hurt him. I, um, I couldn't make out any of his features. And then, when he felt like it, he stepped away and laughed. Is that when you called the police? Yeah, that was before I bought the gun, so I called the police. They came out and surveyed the surrounding forest and asked me a bunch of questions. That was it. They told me they couldn't do much else. I was pretty angry about that at first, but after thinking about it, they were right. After all, he didn't show up on any of the cameras. I gave her a puzzled look. Oh yeah, he came back, she assured me. That's the photo I sent you people, after all. I guess it was about a week ago that I contacted you, wasn't it? I checked my notes and I looked back at her. Yeah, about nine days ago. So he came back. Can we see the area where the camera caught an image of the green fellow? I chuckled. She nodded and we followed her out onto her back deck and into her garden. There was a peeling white fence that signaled where her garden ended and the wilderness began. Bed after bed of once beautiful flowers had wilted into little more than shriveled and wiry stems and petals. Jeremy followed close behind me as we walked along the gravel paths that cut through the backyard. I hunkered down in front of a plant that had maybe once been blue or purple, but was mostly just brown and dead. Putting my hand into the soil, I felt that it was grainy and coarse and pulled my hand back up to my nose. Salt, I said. Someone had heavily salted this poor old woman's flowers. Mary was right, this was very strange indeed. I turned back to the deck where Mary was standing and walked back to her until I came across a familiar looking spot in the backyard. There it was. This is where the photo was taken. Instead of the daffodils found in the photo, there were sprigs of dead vegetation sticking out of the tainted ground lined with quaint red bricks. He came back two nights ago, she said. I looked at Jeremy and saw his staggered expression. Oh, was all I said. Do you have any more photos of the thing? The corners of her mouth came up gently. I have something better. She led us around to the side of her home to a small shed and unlocked the padlock holding the door in place there. The smell struck me instantly and I'm fairly sure that Jeremy gagged while stepping in behind me. I got chills and I knew just then that all of the skepticism in the world could not part that thick death smell. My skin prickled and my throat was dry and my knees stayed stiff. I felt like a robot as I shimmied past dirt stained to tools on the dark shed. I saw the gray lying in a wheelbarrow near the back of the shed and I motioned for Jeremy to get along the opposite side of me so that he could get a better shot of the thing's face. Its eyes were bulbous and its skin was still shiny even as it lay there motionless. I was certain that it would spring up and grab at me and squeeze the life out of me. This was the bona fide E.T., wasn't it? I looked at its scrawny limbs dangle from the sides of its wheelbarrow bed, and I wanted to upchuck as my eyes wandered to the blood-red scattershot wound in its open chest. 
Jeremy's flashlight centered there and that's when I was truly horrified. Underneath its shining skin through the bullet wounds, I could make out a black cotton t-shirt. Mary shuffled in to look at the dead alien, pulling the glasses that hung around her neck from a goldish chain onto her face. I pointed at the head and Jeremy moved his flashlight towards his face. My hand shook and moved forward without me, and I felt around the thing's neck. I didn't want to find it, but I did. There was the edge of the mask. I pulled it up and I dropped it, but didn't hear it slap against the shed floor. I stepped back and almost fell over my own feet. Mary was screaming, I'm sure. The only thing that I really remember was that kid's face. His skin was thin, his cheeks were gaunt, and his face was fixed in a terrified expression. Perpetually terrified. He might have been 16. I ran out of the shed and fell over into the grass. I felt sick and my head was spinning. This was my first dead body up close. Jeremy came out next, turning his camera off and sitting next to me. That's when I was sure that I heard Mary crying. She had realized what she had done, and so had me and Jeremy. I had handed to him, he handled this all much better than I did. He was the one that called the police. They came over and took the body and questioned all of us, and took Mary in for further questioning. Jeremy and I handed over all of the evidence on the case that didn't include a redacted name. As it turns out, you probably shouldn't dress up and prank an old woman with bad eyesight. Jeremy drove and surprisingly didn't talk at all. He kept his eyes on the road and his mouth entirely shut, no longer interested in munching jerky. I thought for sure this job would be relatively easy. I would travel a lot and debunk yokels that had accidentally taken a photo of their own finger. I guess the joke's on me, right? We received an email from Redacted. They told us that our next case should be coming down the line sometime next week. I think I'll be ready to move on from this one by then. But who knows? I wish we did find a gray alien. I watched Jeremy run his french fry into the small puddle of ketchup on his plate and knew that he had been affected by the dead boy as much as I had. Jeremy still talked a lot, seemingly about whatever popped into his head. He talked about his childhood most of all. He told me about all the times that his grandmother had visited him. Apparently, this was the ghost that was most prevalent in his life. If you were to ask my opinion, it was just a kid's way of grieving. Death is hard to understand for lots of people. You'll never ever see that person again and you want nothing more than to see them walk into your home and give you a big hug and tell you that it was all some kind of messed up joke. But kids are especially prone to making stuff up in the face of the unknown. Still, I listened to him and nodded along to all the weird stuff that apparently happened to him when he was younger. The entity that was next in his storytime docket was a man that would follow him around and pester him, just out of the corner of his eyes. I thought that was exceptionally weird. After all, this was not the average modus operandi of haunts. He ate half of his fries and he pushed them away. We were sitting in a small overnight diner in Gallatin, Tennessee. The neon light blinking open sat next to the window at our booth and... Every few milliseconds, it illuminated Jeremy's moon face in a glazed blue. It really accentuated the fact that he had bags under his eyes and that he had not shaved over the past couple of days. We had been lying in a Super 8 motel when he had asked me if I was hungry. Looking at the alarm clock next to my bed, I saw that it was 2.15 a.m. Knowing that I wouldn't be getting much sleep, what with that young boy's face ever present in my mind, I gave Jeremy the affirmative. After he pushed his plate of half-finished fries to the side, I understood that he had not really been hungry either. Jeremy was normally fervent in his ghost stories. He was so excited to let me in on this strange side of his otherwise normal and boring life that he would get carried away and obviously exaggerate and speak with his hands. But when he spoke about the man that pestered him just out of the corners of his eyes, he was quiet and intense. 
He told me that his grandmother was the one that always kept the man at bay. But sometimes at night, he would hear the man whispering to him, telling Jeremy that he was going to take him away someday. Have you seen him since then? I asked. Jeremy shook his head. But sometimes I just wonder when he'll be back, you know. Who's to say that he'll be back? I don't know. I watched the neon sign paint Jeremy's face a few more times, sipping on my decaf. Jeremy may be a little bit too into this paranormal stuff. I like it and it's interesting, but his life seems to be steeped in it. Everywhere that he turns, oh look, a ghost. It's a bit much. Still something about that man he talks about does send chills up my spine even if I know it's ridiculous. You ever seen anything like that? I asked him. What? You mean the dead kid? I nodded. Not once before. Something dawned on me. You said that some investigators go missing. You said you knew some of them. Yeah, he said. Well, you've been doing this for a while now, right? Yeah, two years. So, you've worked with the others. Well, that's right. Have you ever seen anything actually paranormal while working on a case? A few times, yeah. Most of the time, it is just a hoax. Some kids are playing a prank, but sometimes you do see wild stuff. I've seen a statue that cries blood. I've seen a snake with six heads. I've also seen... He pressed his hands together into a pyramid position over the table. A living, breathing woman without any skin. Jeremy sighed. Believe it or not, I've done my research on you. I know you think guys like me are just crazy. I've read a few of your articles. I started to protest, but he put his hand up. No, no, it's alright, really, I get it. Some people haven't seen enough. I'll give you some advice, though. Most of the investigators that I've seen go off grid did so because they were a lot like you. They wanted something tangible, they wanted proof. And when they found it, it was too much for them. Just keep that in mind. We paid our bill and we left the diner. I rubbed my hands together as we stepped into the cool January air and walked over to the passenger side of the truck. It took a few minutes before I stopped to see my own breath inside the cab of the truck. He drove us back to the motel and I could tell that he got about as much sleep as I did. None. The file for our next case came down a little sooner than either one of us had expected and we printed the papers off looking over them. Some of them were photos of riverbanks but most of them were documents with info dumps. Apparently this was a genuine haunt. This wasn't so much of an isolated incident, but rather something of a local bit of folklore coming out of Virginia Beach. I had not expected a place known for drunken teenagers and lower back henna tattoos to be a hotbed for spirits, but I guess there's lots of things I don't know about the paranormal. I wasn't in the city of Virginia Beach, but rather just outside of the bustling city. There was a small community a little further inland known as Cooked Peak that you won't find on any map where people hunt and make deer jerky and know how to fish on the freshwater rivers that run out to the coast. People dress in camel and can their food in mason jars and everybody owns a truck or two. As we traveled deeper into the pine forests of the country, I felt claustrophobic and it only served to remind me of Mary's property, which gave me a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. We drove as the evening turned into night once again and somewhere off in the hills I heard what sounded like the shrill screaming of a woman. When I turned to Jeremy, I knew that he had heard it too. Mountain lions, right? I said. He nodded. Sure, and kept his eyes on the road. All names besides mine and the equipment guys have been altered. I will be posting my findings here. Thank you. Case 2 Here comes a bit of an old school Irish folklore in the form of a weeping woman. I had heard the fairy tales involving the banshee a few times, but never knew where it came from. I'm sure that many of you too have heard the phrase, screaming like a banshee or some variation of it. I did my research before we left the motel room up in Tennessee, 
and learned quite a bit about the spirit or fairy depending on who you ask. A screaming Irish woman is known to make an appearance as the harbinger death. Terrifying stuff, right? Well, as far as I'm aware, she's never been known to hurt anyone. The banshee is nothing more than an alarm. She's scary in the same way that death is scary. It's coming. She's only there to accentuate it. Jeremy took a small gravel route up to the side of the mountain and we passed the sign that marked the small community of Crooked Peak. The trees passed by and we heard the mountain lion a few more times. Of course, my mind wandered and started painting pictures of the wary woman screaming at our arrival. It wasn't some large cat out there in the darkness that could rip our faces off, but some bit of ridiculous folklore. Sure, that makes sense. I was arrogant. The actual community of Crooked Peak was more reminiscent of an Americanized and modernized version of an impoverished European village. In another way of putting it, this was a trailer park. We pulled off of the road and into the pines a little ways after failing to find a lodge. Jeremy slept in the cab and I crawled into the bed of the truck with a small space heater. I stared at the roof of the camper top and drifted off to sleep better than I had in any of the rooms that we had stayed in up until this point. We found the address in our redacted file and pulled into the meager driveway of a single wide trailer with rusting side panels and blankets hung in the windows instead of curtains. The trailer sat directly in front of a freshwater creek that opened up into a river further down the mountain, and I heard the rushing water as we stepped out of the truck. The early morning air was wet and cold and I had to keep kicking the mud off my sneakers as we moved onto the front deck of the abode. I knocked on the screen door as Jeremy readied the camera behind me, and I noticed that somebody was moving from inside of the trailer, peeking out from behind one of those hanging blankets. And then the door opened and I was faced with a great big mustachioed man in his 40s with a trucker cap. He carried a styrofoam cup and motioned me into the home. The man introduced himself and I recognized his name from the file. Mark Campbell. We followed him inside and sat at his kitchen. He took the chair opposite me in a very relaxed and sprawled demeanor. The room's walls were once white but now stained yellow and even brown in some places, but overall it was surprisingly tidy and warm and inviting. He told me that his wife was out with his son and we began the interview. Not really knowing how to begin, I broke my facade of professionalism and just outright asked him, So, a banshee. The words felt weird in my mouth and I was glad to have gotten them out. Mark laughed a spit of dark brownish liquid into his styrofoam cup. I know how it sounds. He spoke with a deep drawl. But yeah, lots of the kids in the neighborhood started saying they saw a lady down by the river. Some of them said she was singing but most of them said she was crying. Scared the heck out of a lot of us at first. I mean, we were worried that maybe some lady had been attacked by a wild animal, or had fallen and gotten hurt. Lots of us spread out and searched the woods on both sides of the river and we found nothing. So none of the adults out here have seen her. Well, that ain't true. That was just the uh, first instance of it. A few weeks passed and we all just thought the kids were making stuff up. And then we started hearing screams out in those woods. Scared the ever-loving crap out of me the first time I heard it. Sounded like it was coming from right outside my bathroom window. Thank God I was already on the toilet. He laughed a little at this. I thought it was one of the guys messing with me at first. But I asked about it and nobody ever came forward. So you've heard it? Yeah, I heard her alright. Have you seen it? He stared down at the table for a minute. Well, yeah. Me and my buddy John went out to the river two weeks ago. Said we were going to do some fishing. Really, it was just a way for us to get away for a while and have a couple beers, you know. We were talking about something or another when we heard it. Made my skin crawl. It felt like my skeleton wanted to jump out of my skin. I, I don't really know how to explain it. You know that feeling you get 
like somebody walking over your grave, and does that make sense? I nodded even though I had no idea what he was talking about. Well, yeah. She screamed and so me and John shoot up out of our seats in our little boat and start looking over the sides of the river. At first we didn't see nothing, and then I spotted her on the right side over near the tree line. She was wearing a dirty nightgown or something like it. Her face was covered in stringy gray hair. Well, I start freaking out, trying to bring the boat over to the side of the river, telling John that we gotta help her out. But John wasn't having any of it. He grabbed me by the back of my shirt. Now, I don't guess you've met him yet. John ain't a big fella, but in that moment he surprised me. He shoved me down and started screaming at me, telling me not to help her. He was pissed off. I wanted to fight back, but when I saw the look in his eyes, it felt like if I tried to help the woman, he'd kill me. I knew that. So I just stayed still and we passed her. Pretty soon, we went around a bend in the river and she disappeared. He trailed off. Caught a few fish that day though, so it wasn't a complete loss, right? Is there any way that I could speak to John? Yeah, sure, he should be home. We moved out onto his deck so that Mark could smoke. He pulled out a pack of Winstons from his pocket. I asked for one and he lit it. I'm not a smoker, but I wanted something to do with my hands. He tossed his dipped tobacco out over the deck's railing and lit his own cigarette. I coughed on the first few puffs, but grew accustomed to it quicker than I thought I would. We looked out onto the river and then I heard something very weird. It was something plucked right out of a horror film. When I turned to look back at Jeremy with his camera, I noticed a little girl skipping down the gravel road just beyond our truck. The little girl was singing and me and Jeremy both moved into the driveway to get a better glimpse of the girl. She was skipping around in a wide circular motion and wearing a faded blue dress. She sung, Here comes the banshee, soon you'll see. When the bell rings, soon she'll bring. Your last breath. I hate to admit it, but my arms sprung up with goose flesh. I turned to Jeremy to make sure that he had been recording that, and he nodded. I smoked a little more than half of the Winston that Mark had given me, and I stoked it out. We returned to Mark's kitchen, and he put on a pot of coffee for us. I was extremely thankful to be holding that warm mug as I continued to ask questions. Will everybody in Crooked Peak corroborate your story? And John, well, that's for sure. But I'm sure if you ask around, you'll find that most everybody has a story about that lady. Is that right? I didn't meant for the question to come out so smug, but Mark noticed. You don't believe me? Asked Mark. I swear that I heard Jeremy snicker a little from behind his camera. I'm only being thorough, I lied. Mark grinned and packed more dip into the side of his mouth. Oh, you will before you're done here. I grinned back and doubted it. Mark was nice enough to start making us some breakfast. Jeremy powered down his camera and we chewed away together at sausage patties and eggs. After dismissing Mark when he asked if we wanted any more food, we sat back and reveled in a nice home-cooked meal, no matter how simple it was. I had been eating gas station burritos and McDonald's for a while now, Jeremy had been doing this for even longer than me and for the first time, I empathized and understood his chubby body. After small talk, Jeremy decided it was time to get back to business. Setting the camera on the table and flicking it on, I re-upped on my coffee. Can you remember at what point in the river you saw it? Uh, probably, but I don't really want to go in those woods anytime soon. Did you get a good look at its face? Not really. Like I said, her face was covered by her hair. Has anybody tried talking to it? Not that I know of. Feeling as though we had gotten all that we would for Mark, we left and looked over the file in the truck. The second address was that of John Williams, the man that had gone fishing with Mark. We found the number of his trailer and we knocked on the door. A small man with blonde hair and a dirty tank top invited us in. My immediate reaction was of disgust. The air was thick and it smelled like medicine, 
It was not overtly gross in the tray there was, just as neat as Mark's, though it was very lived in. And then I heard beeping and John motioned us to follow him into the back bedroom, and I realized where the smell was coming from. There was an ancient, unconscious man lying in the bed there. He was bare-chested and sweaty. The unconscious man's beard was wiry and the hair in his head, though long, was very thin. This man was dying, I knew that. John informed us that this was his great-grandfather. The poor old man was dying, even John knew that. He just didn't have the heart to pull the plug, so to speak. Several machines sat next to the bed and booped and beeped every so often. The machine's tubes ran into the old man's throat, and wires clung to his chest that rose and fell in soft but arduous motions. John asked us to turn off the camera. Jeremy complied. After John changed the bed's blankets and pillows, we moved into the living room and Jeremy powered the camera back on. You were out fishing with Mark Campbell about two weeks ago, I asked. John nodded, staring directly into the camera with something bordering on suspicion. Mark says that you might have seen a banshee. Saying the word aloud still felt weird. Yeah, I saw her. That fool wanted us to pull up on the riverbank next to her. He said that you grew violent when he tried to help her. I did, admitted John, his shoulders slumping and his eyes going to the floor. I didn't want it to be that way, but I didn't want to take any chances. He seemed to glance at the door where his great-grandfather rested. She brings death, you know. I nodded. Banshees are known for that, yes. She scares you, doesn't she? Yeah. Is it possible that it was just a woman that needed help? No, no way. His left knee started bobbing agitated. Why didn't you try talking to? He cut me off. You know what? You guys need to go. Just get out, all right. I'm sorry to be rude and all, but you two need to go, please. I looked at Jeremy and he shrugged. We left the trailer and I stood, leaning next to the truck while Jeremy put away his equipment. What now? I asked. You're not going to like it, said Jeremy. What do you mean? I asked. We're going camping. It occurred to me that he was much more accustomed to this paranormal hunting gig than I was, but Jeremy was right. I did not like that. We had a tent tucked away in our equipment, but that didn't mean that I wanted to use it. Then we parked at Mark's house and asked him if we could leave our vehicle there overnight and he told us that it would be fine, and then we wrangled the tent in our backpacks and started our track. Walking alongside the creek, it wasn't long before the stream widened and changed into a loud rushing river. Jeremy walked ahead and I continuously looked over the file, scanning the landscape for the same area on the photos, but I couldn't be sure. What was that all about? I asked Jeremy, attempting to take my mind off of the cold air. You mean John? Sure, he was acting a little funny. Yeah, believe it or not, there are lots of superstitious people that don't take kindly to ghost hunters. He said this all in a mock southern accent. Seriously though, some people think that we should just leave well enough alone. They'd rather not stir up any trouble with the beings from beyond. You believe in stuff like this, right? Yeah, but I also don't mind stirring things up a bit. He laughed. We traveled alongside the river until the sky grew overcast and dark. We went into the pine forest, maybe 20 or 30 yards from the river, and found a nice flat area to set up camp. I'll tell you something, as somebody that's not the outdoorsy type, it is difficult to get a fire going with wet twigs. When night came, we sat around the roaring fire and I shifted in my cross-legged position, looking at my traveling companion. Want to tell the spooky story? He smiled at me but stayed quiet. And do you think about your grandmother a lot? I asked while staring back into the fire. I do. She was a nice woman. I'm sorry. That's fine. And we didn't swap any scary stories over the campfire that night. I think Jeremy was on edge because he didn't talk much at all. 
I kept my ears perked up, listening for anything off in the distant woods that could be the voice of a screaming spirit. When our yawns became too much to ignore, we crawled into the spacious tent. Believe it or not, the constant noise of the river and crickets was relatively calming, and it didn't take long for me to fall asleep. Something violently woke me, and at first I didn't realize that it was a scream. It sounded like it was coming from inside of my own head. I shot out of my sleeping bag, crouching on my knees in the dark tent. I turned to make sure that Jeremy was there. He still lay wrapped in his sleeping bag. The scream died abruptly. Terrified and confused, I reached over and began shaking him, unzipping his sleeping bag and trying to pull it off. I shook and shook and he rolled over from his side onto his back and I saw that his eyes were open, but they weren't looking at me. They were looking somewhere far off into oblivion. This scared the heck out of me and I jumped away from him at first, letting him roll back onto his side. I thought that he was dead, but after working up the courage to touch his still form again, I felt his body going through the motions of breathing. My attention shot back to whatever had made that noise. I stayed completely still and not even breathing. My eyes adjusted in the dark and I saw a shapeless form through the tense flaps. My stomach lurched into my throat and I stared at it. Another screeching howl and I flinched. I was positive in that moment that I was going to die. Whatever was out there was going to come through that tent flap and suck the life right out of my body. I finally understood what Mark was talking about when he had described the feeling of having somebody walk over your grave. I heard something that sounded like a whimper that grew into a howling sob and it shook the whole world around me. And then the air in the tent grew cold and my teeth chattered and I realized that I was weeping. Tears were streaming down my face and I wiped them away. I felt overwhelmingly sad all of a sudden. It was the most miserable that I've ever been. It felt like I was falling. Despair would be the right word for broad strokes purposes but I don't know that there's any word that I could ever attribute to the amount of sadness that I felt. After brushing away my tears, I looked back at the spot that I had seen the shadow. It was gone. The natural sounds of the forest took over once again. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. When Jeremy finally awoke, the sun had just started to creep over the landscape. I wanted to hit him. I wanted to be mad at him. But instead, I started telling him about what had happened while he had slept and it all came out as gibberish. And then I stopped and asked him why he had been sleeping with his eyes open. This seemed to bother him because his round face grew grim and strained. He muttered something about sometimes doing that when he slept. We started packing the tent and gathering our supplies and putting them away into our packs. We did this quickly, efficiently, and silently. But then something caught the corner of my eye. Something was shining in the pile of burnt wood where we had constructed our campfire. I hunkered down in front of the dead pile of wood and reached in to pick up the shiny thing. It was a silver bell about the size of my palm. I shook it in my hand, listening to it ring. I tucked this away into my backpack after showing it to Jeremy. He didn't seem that interested in it but this may be the first bit of physical, substantial evidence that I've ever seen. It didn't take us long to make our way back to the truck. Our steps were hasty and neither one of us seemed to want to be in that forest any longer than we had to. Tired and sweaty, we started quickly putting our stuff away into the back of the truck. Just as we were about to slam it shut and hightail it, the screen door of Mark's trailer swung open vigorously. Before I knew it, John was coming at me stiff-legged. He pulled back his fist and landed it squarely against my left eye. My vision was blurry and I was on the ground. When I looked up, I saw Jeremy standing between me and John. Mark had rushed out of the trailer and was attempting to pull John away, holding back both of his arms. Mark was yelling at us, Y'all need to get out of here. Jeremy helped me to my feet and shoved me into the passenger seat of the cab and rounded the engine to jump into the driver's side. John was kicking and spitting at him as Jeremy rushed past. 
We peeled out of the driveway and I doctored my bleeding face with napkins from the glove compartment. We found out later that John's great-grandfather had passed away. John found him that morning and had rushed over looking for us. I understand why he was angry, but something sticks out in my mind. Here comes the banshee, soon you'll see. When the bell rings, soon she'll bring your last breath. That song that the little girl was singing. I rang the bell that morning and I wonder if I had killed the old man when I shook it in my hand. I can't think like that though. While driving, Jeremy asked me something strange. Do you know that your hair is graying? I flipped on the sun visor to look at myself in the mirror there. My left eye was swelling shut. The hair near my ears are silver now. After we passed the sign telling us that we were leaving Crooked Peak, I breathed a little easier. I don't know what was outside of our tent that night. I didn't get a good look at it. I'm still a little shaken if I'm being honest. We sent the bell into redacted as evidence yesterday. This job might literally be the death of me. Thank you to everyone that sent me PMs asking how it felt to get punched out by John while investigating my last case. In case you were wondering, it felt awesome. Also, sorry for the last update, but Jeremy and I had to wait around while some guys from Redacted worked on the truck. Since Jeremy has been acting strange, I decided to take over driving and almost screwed up the transmission. I'm not the world's best driver. Now, let's begin. So, you won't read about these little guys on any folklore wiki. And to be honest, I had never heard of them, but Jeremy seemed to have had a run-in with them a while back. They are similar to your garden variety gnomes or small fairies except for the fact that they have scaly black skin and pure white eyes without any pupils. At least, that's what the testimonies say in the file. This file, much like the first, was accompanied by a single photograph of one of the creatures but the outline of its body is faded or fuzzy. I really can't tell given the quality of the image. The little thing has something hanging from its open maw, and I'm told by the documents that they like taking things. Sometimes it's small and sometimes not. There's a small bed and breakfast in upstate Maryland where this phenomena occurs. Apparently, the couple that owns it uses these creatures as a kind of selling point for people that are into the unexplainable or paranormal. They seem to do rather well with this attraction, as they have their own website where you can purchase reservations for roughly $250 a head. No, I would not be linking it here. I know it may seem weird, but hey, people pay to stay at the Lizzie Borden house, so whatever floats your boat. And Jeremy hasn't been sleeping well and so as I said, I've taken over the driving responsibilities for the time being. I must reiterate that I'm not the navigator that he is as I've gotten us lost several times now. Something unsettling that I need to report is that Jeremy does sleep often while I drive, but he seems to be having nightmares. Sometimes he screams himself awake and sometimes he thrashes around and scares the ever-loving Christ out of me. Whatever is going on with him, I have reason to believe it's something to do with the man he mentioned. The one that lives in the corners of his vision. Jeremy whispers about him in his sleep. He worries me. I've grown quite fond of him and his long stories and I don't know what I would do if I was forced to travel by myself. He doesn't joke around as much as he did. Could it be some form of psychosis? Whenever I ask him about it, he just gives me a squinty look and says, Don't worry about me, Alex. All names besides mine and the equipment guys have been altered, and I will be posting my findings here. Thank you. Case 3 The house was obviously built early in the last century, but it is well kept and the shrubs that lined the front of the porch gave it a quaint and homely feel. There were a few other homes on this stretch of road, but they were spaced out from one another with large swaths of Greenland. It looked like a nice family's house, and when I pulled into the driveway, I noticed an old man waving me over to pull into the grass of the front yard. 
There was a sign in a flowery cursive typeface adjacent to where he directed me to park and it read, Welcome to the Mischief House. This made me breathe a sigh of relief. After my last case, this one would be a breeze. Nice and easy. I would not be terrified investigating this place. It all just seemed so inviting. This should have clued me into the fact that it was not at all. I cut the engine and I stepped out of the truck with Jeremy sliding out from the passenger side. Nao, said the old man putting out his hand for a shake. I took it and introduced myself. His name was Rick and he informed me that his wife Rita was out but would be coming back shortly. I helped Jeremy wrangle his equipment and we set out across the lawn with me carrying the EVP detectors and him toting his trusty camera over his shoulder. Jeremy had told me that we would be setting the audio recording devices up in several rooms of the house and that we would also be securing several cameras in hidden locations. We sat the equipment on the porch and Rick led us inside to give us a tour. The house was well decorated and had a good feeling to it, but was totally barren of personal items. It was like walking through a museum, not a home. All of the photos on the walls were stock images of plant life or landscapes. He took us to the kitchen, telling us that his wife had initially noticed one of the little black creatures peering up at her from inside of the sink drain. They even had the plate that she had dropped and shattered out of fright on display. Hardly evidence. I know this is a strange detail to include, but I feel that it's pertinent. While Rick motioned to hear her there telling us about the innumerable sightings of the strange creatures, it felt like something was tugging at my socks. I don't know how else to explain it. It felt like my socks were constricting around my feet and it made my whole body itch. The last stop on the tour was the room that we would be staying in. It was a large bedroom on the second story with elegant furniture and large doors that opened up onto a small terrace. It was overwhelmingly nice. I guess that if you're going to charge suckers $2.50 a night, you might as well gussy the place up a bit, huh? From the bedroom, we noticed a car pulling into the driveway. Ah, that's the wife, said Rick. She likes to greet all guests that stay in the mischief house. The old man accentuated those last three words like Vincent Price and wiggled his fingers at us like a cartoon ghost. When he saw mine and Jeremy's unmoving expressions, he shrugged and waved us to follow him downstairs. We dropped the gear in the bedroom and went with Rick. I want to preface this by saying that Rita is a nice woman. She really is. But she's also one of those people that gets too comfortable explaining all the strange things that ever happened to her. She's a self-proclaimed lone witch. She's probably seen more spirits than even Jeremy. I think she sees one every time that someone farts. She is very obnoxious and I could not stand listening to her explain what my aura meant to her. She said something about my aura being a deep and vibrant red. She held both of my hands in hers and said that it looked like I was on fire. You're burning, she said. It was intense, but she assured me that it was a good thing. Weird. While I spoke with the owners of the home, Jeremy lumbered behind, carrying the smaller cameras into the house. This couple was enthralled to have a pair of paranormal investigators in their mischief house. I didn't have the heart to tell them that I was looking forward to debunking this house of theirs. I think they were so happy to have us there because it could in some way substantiate their price of admission to others. They spoke quickly and I was so tired from the drive that I could barely keep up with what they were saying in my notes. But I seemed to remember it being the same old song and dance. A few more spook enthusiasts. I did let it slip that my graying hair was such because of a possible banshee. I shouldn't have done that. Rita gave me some crystals that should take care of it. The sun began to crest over the hill and we went inside so that I could help Jeremy set up the remaining equipment. By the time that we had everything prepared, it was dark outside and Rita was beginning to grate on my nerves. Something occurred to me as I watched Jeremy position the monitor on the desk in the upstairs bedroom. Jeremy was losing weight. I could see it as he moved around. 
His clothing didn't cling to his skin like it once did. I had not even noticed it before. As I watched him, he turned, noticing me looking at him. What? He asked tiredly, haggardly. His eyes were red and dark. Nothing. Go downstairs and double check that all the mics are properly working. Yeah, I said. I waved into each camera and spoke. Whenever Jeremy heard me coming through on the monitor upstairs, he would yell. Cool, everything was ready. The owners watched us go on about our business, giddy, and then they laughed. I watched them pull out of the driveway from one of the first story windows. Their headlights splashed over the house once and then disappeared. It was just me, Jeremy, in silence. He sat adjacent the desk and I sat on the bed. We kept the bedroom door open and while you watched the monitor, I watched the threshold, almost willing that some small black creature would scamper across the opening in the hallway. My socks felt uncomfortable again, like they were tugging at the skin in between my toes. So I took them off and I massaged my feet. My feet were pretty rank, but Jeremy didn't seem to notice. You said that you had a run into these little guys before, right? I asked him. Jeremy looked at me with those tired eyes. Yeah. Did you ever get any photos or videos of them? He shook his head. I hate to admit it, but living a life where you indefinitely travel tends to make you grasp onto any constant in your life. Jeremy had become that for me. It saddened me to know that he was going through something so intangible. I remember thinking that constantly being on the road was starting to wear on him. Hoping to rehash a previous conversation, I asked him, What's wrong? Is it the man? He sat a little straighter in his chair. I'm not so sure that he's a man. Well, what do you mean? I mean, I don't think he's dead. I don't think he's any kind of spirit. I just... He trailed off. I just don't know what to do. His shoulders slumped and he seemed to let his guard down a little. I see him all the time. When I'm awake, he's always there, watching me just out of the corners of my eye. For a while, it worked to sleep. I never saw him in my dreams, but he watches me there now too. He whispers to me. He whispers some of the most heinous stuff that I've ever heard. And he shows me stuff too. I could feel my arms prickling with goose flesh and I rubbed them embarrassed. Looking over my first case well, I am supposed to be the scully, but the way he was talking that night really, really scared me. What does he show you? He shows me that there are other places that you can go after you die. This came out in a whisper. Jeremy rubbed the spot on his nose where his glasses rested. Jeremy stopped and stood up, still holding his nose. He ripped the glasses off of his face and threw them away from him so that they clattered through the open doorway and into the dark hallway. Alex! He screamed at me. Screw Alex! He was shaking now. Those aren't my glasses. I don't know where they came from. He was weeping without sobbing. Jeremy always wore glasses. I moved from the bed, putting my hand on his shoulder, hoping to calm him down. Hey buddy, hey, it's alright man, just breathe, it's okay man. He slapped my hand away and sat back down in the chair. Both of his knees bobbed convulsively. You don't understand. He's doing this, he's coming to get me. That's how he works, he takes things. He moves them around, he changes reality. He's always there, even when you don't see him there. To say that Jeremy was scaring me would put it lightly. For the first time, I wasn't sure what he was capable of. What? He said, looking down at his hands. Alex! He screamed, cutting through me with his eyes. These are my hands. Help me, help me, Alex, help! He extended his hands up to display what he meant. These aren't my hands. Don't you believe me? The lights in the house flickered dark for what felt like forever but Jeremy and I were in the pitch black for probably 15 or 20 seconds. Some warm fluid is shot through the air in the darkness and struck me in the face. I flinched and wiped away at it, entirely confused. When the lights flickered on again, I tripped backwards, scrambling away from Jeremy. I landed on the floor and violently pressed my back against the bottom of the bed. 
Jeremy was gnawing on one of his wrists. I looked down at the pool of blood forming underneath him. He was hunched over on both knees now. I was covered in my friend's blood. I remember the only thing that I could think in the moment was that nobody could lose that much blood and live. And then the lights flickered again and I could hear Jeremy screaming through the sounds of spurting blood and gnashing and popping sinews. Help me, Alex. Help me get these hands off me. They're not mine. The lights flickered again and again and again rhythmic. The bedroom became a completely macabre rave. When then the bright flash was coming on and off, I could see Jeremy digging away at his wrist in still frames. I looked away and closed my eyes. And then I heard a whisper-like scream carried off through a cavern echoing. Hello, was all that it said. I popped my eyes open and within the frames of light, I saw a man standing in the bedroom doorway. I say it's a man because it was the easiest way for me to explain it to you here. His outline was faded and he was dark. But that grin, that dang grin, I got a good look at that. Jeremy's screams began to echo too. It was like I was falling into a never-ending black pit. I could feel my very atoms coming apart. And then it stopped and the lights came on. Jeremy was gone and so was the man. I can tell you that the only thing more terrifying than seeing that man was the silence that followed. I now know what Jeremy was talking about. It's the waiting. Taking stock of my surroundings, I saw that there was no blood, no evidence that Jeremy had ever been there. He was just gone. My first instinct was to rush to my cell phone and call the police. I typed in 9-1 and then stopped. I cleared it out and I called Redacted. After ringing a few times, the line disconnected. In frustration, I slung the phone across the room. I peered around the corner of the doorway into the hallway. I could feel my blood in my ears. My whole body was rubber. I could feel my guts twisting up in knots. After silently counting to three, I ran down the hall towards the stairs. I slid across the floor on my shoeless feet and cantered down the stairs, taking steps two at a time. Freeze, said some figure at the base of the steps. Their flashlight blinded me and I lost my footing, slipping backwards and tumbling down the stairs. I still have a few bruises down my back from that. Don't move, they said. I noticed that the figure wasn't alone. About four or five others were there. As my eyes adjusted to the lights, I saw that they were all wearing camel gear and aggressively pointing rifles in our directions. They all wore helmets that covered their faces. They tied my hands and cleared the house and confirmed my identity. It was only after a lengthy interrogation that they admitted they were with Redacted. I don't know how it is that they responded so quickly. I still don't know what happened to Jeremy. I don't know what it is that I saw at the mischief house. I didn't see any of those little black creatures though, so who knows if they're real or not. Maybe if you find yourself in the area, you can check it out for yourself. But something tells me that Redacted has commandeered the home. I can't find the mischief house website anymore and I've tried calling the old couple that owns it to no avail. I'm sitting in my room at a Hampton. It feels lonely. My correspondence with representatives from Redacted has picked up. They email me a lot more than before. They still haven't given me my next assignment, but one of the emails they sent me did inquire as to whether I would feel comfortable investigating things outside of the States. I need to find out what happened to Jeremy. One more thing as I was standing outside with my hands bound, waiting for the paramilitary personnel to clear the house. I overheard the man guarding me say something into his walkie. Do you think this is a gateway? That was all I heard before he noticed that I was listening to him. He turned the walkie off and stood at attention. I haven't seen the man that lives in the corners of her eyes since that night, but something tells me that he's seen me. I'm going to try and get some sleep. Take care.